The Easter story is a story that's familiar to all of us, a story that likely we grew up with, a story from the past, a celebration of an event in human history. But as one of my dearest minister friends says, Easter is not a spectator sport. It is very much participatory. Thank you, Reverend Brenda Errett, for that reminder that Easter is not about recounting or revisiting a story from the past. It is about awakening the story and the resources within us. The Easter story has been framed in such a way that it has been locked in a vault for so many centuries. We've been led to believe that the Easter story is only about Jesus for so many centuries. Yet when we take it on, when we take on the metaphysical dive into the story, it becomes a story about the human condition, about our divine, our true nature, and about transformation. And it holds the key to the path of transformation and awakening. So are we willing to take the Easter story beyond an event in history? We know that history distorts, it exaggerates, it edits, it manipulates life. We know that it can be used for gain, it can be twisted to promote agendas, and it often replaces truth with myth. But if something becomes an experience or an event in consciousness, consciousness is always a deeply personal experience that goes beyond dogma, beyond time and space, beyond conditions, beyond history, beyond myth, and into mysticism. We've been led to believe this traditional story that teaches about suffering, sin, and resurrection, that teaches that God sent his only son to die for our sins, and that only in that sacrifice could we be saved. Only in that sacrifice is there a resolution to the divine problem of the human condition. We have been led to believe this is about an event in history and how to clear our sins or how to prepare us for eternity or how to follow the rules, not the rules of Jesus, the master teacher, but the rules of religion and dogma and conformity. So can we take that dive into mysticism? The author, John Shelby Spong, he, he authored the book, Christ Christianity Must Change or Die, along with many other books. And, and he is a radical as far as awakening the depth of the Christian way or the spiritual practice. He said this, he, in the invitation for us to go beyond Jesus and the Easter story as being held captive to what he calls fear, religion, insecurity, and even neuroses, and to also move beyond throwing it out entirely and letting it become a fading memory, as he says, or a symbol, he says, of an age that is no more and a nostalgic reminder of our believing past. He says that neither option, neither one of those options are worth pursuing. He says about the cross, he says this, he says the cross and the view of the cross as the sacrifice for the sins of the world is a barbarian idea based on primitive concepts of God and must be dismissed. A deep breath here. <sighs> based on primitive concepts of God that must be dismissed. So welcome to the fold if you have struggled before with scripture and struggled with the Easter story. The good news is I do believe that we are meant to struggle with it. One of my favorite teachers of this time and author Richard Rohr said this about the cross. He said the cross solved our problem by first revealing our real problem, our universal pattern of scapegoating and sacrificing others. The cross exposes forever the scene of our crime. John Shelby Spong talks about the cross as being the ultimate parable. In unity, we teach that Jesus did not die for our sins, but rather died by the sins of people, by the sins of humanity, or by the sins of the time, by the errors, the error thinking, the toxic consciousness of the time. That there is life and there is suffering, but we can create suffering and put it upon each other. And even in the midst of that experience of this 
Easter story of the transformation that it offers us, even in the midst of this story, we are reminded of the fullness of the teachings of radical, radical forgiveness, of pure love, and of the master teacher saying, I don't have a circle that leaves anyone out. Everyone is included in this circle of love, in this circle of practice, in this circle of life. So in unity, we teach that we dive beyond the literal, beyond the historical story. We dive into the metaphysical truth. We dive into the spiritual power of this story and of the life and the teachings of Jesus the Christ. So what is worth pursuing? What is worth pursuing? The radical rabbi, the master metaphysician, the universal Jesus, the cosmic Christ consciousness, Jesus as the path to God consciousness, Jesus as a way shower of awakening into the unity consciousness, into life as wholeness, God as love, the spiritual practice as available and accessible right here, right now, beyond dogma, beyond religion. In the struggle of the human condition and suffering, we can find our wholeness. We can experience our oneness. Deepak Chopra in the book, The Third Jesus, The Christ We Cannot, cannot Ignore, talks about the cosmic consciousness, the cosmic Christ. And he says, Jesus exists in our own awareness at the level of God consciousness. But so often people worship the story and the man and forget about the path to which he was pointing. Forget about the way he was showing. So first we must take the step of releasing Jesus from captivity and manipulation. Letting go of the archaic idea that this story's highest purpose is to guilt others, that the highest purpose is to convert others or usher in conformity or urge people to take on a doctrine. When the master teacher himself taught a spiritual practice beyond doctrine, the master teacher taught unity consciousness, taught that we are whole and holy. We are beyond the confines of labels, groups, and conditioning. We are beyond our religious upbringing. And to look past the religion of the time and into the spiritual practice, into the true knowing that the Father and I are one or the Source and I are one, that we are in our fullness in the trinity of mind, idea, and expression. So if we use this story and if we allow this story to continue to be used in our culture, in our society, in our world, and in our own hearts for guilting or polarizing or telling people what they should do, what to think, how to vote, what to say, or training people to go out and question people, trying to capitalize on any spiritual insecurity or declaring that they have the answer or truth, the one truth, the one story the one solution, we are missing the mark. Spong urges us to look out for what he says are human beings claiming that they know how God operates. He says Christianity is, I believe, about expanded life, heightened consciousness, and achieving a new humanity. It's not about closed minds, supernatural interventions, and fallen creation, guilt, original sin, or divine rescue. I see this Easter story as holding the key to healing and transformation. As a living invitation into the dynamic understanding of the human and the spiritual condition of an unfoldment of our oneness, our unity, in the midst of any and every experience we have. So today, let's take a deep dive into a couple aspects of this story. The Garden of Gethsemane and the tomb. Many have been in the garden. And many have had their own tomb experiences. Many are no doubt 
having the garden experience and the tomb experience right now. And certainly on our life paths, we will encounter these experiences. I don't know one person who has been left out of the garden experience or the tomb experience as far as an opportunity to transform and to grow. So the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is known as an occasion of great mental or spiritual suffering, a place of that suffering. The scene of agony, the scene of betrayal, the place where we ask why or what, where we are trying to reason with this reality and this experience we call life. It's a time to reconcile the human condition and the spiritual path. It's a time of mind tantrums and metabolizing toxicity, error, missing the mark, pain, suffering, our attachments, discord, those feelings of the human condition that can tear us apart, can separate us, can challenge us, and can sometimes bring us to our knees. We are sometimes in the garden struggling with betrayal, with how life can seem unfair, unjust, with why, why, why. And so often wishing away what is. Wishing away the present moment. So if we look to the master teacher and we look to scripture, we can find a key to support humanity in birthing a greater expression. In the garden in Luke twenty two forty four, the master teacher in agony prayed. It says his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And that process of getting it all out in prayer, that process of being in the garden and spending the time there, going to the garden alone, letting the faculties, the divine faculties, the disciples step apart for a while and fall asleep, but going in to the fullness of that experience, not stopping short, not trying to get out before it's time but being fully present in the garden. That experience is what ignited a strength. It's what built up spiritual resources, drawing them forth, drawing them forth, not through just some simple, ah, beautiful, easy, peaceful meditation where you're just nurtured into an expanded awareness of something that is, but that grueling process that we sometimes go to in the human condition where we are just pulling and saying, sweet spirit, be in me the understanding, take this from me, let me feel, let me know, let me be present, let me be transformed, even in the midst of this, here I am, I am open, I am willing, I am humble. I am present. Too often, spiritually, in the spiritual condition, the human condition, we cut that process off before it's complete. Before we have drawn forth the gifts. Before we have really wrestled really asked, really been present. But we are coded to become available to extraordinary dimensions. And these dimensions are available in the garden. You notice that Jesus did not come out of the garden with resentment, did not come out of the garden with anger, fighting, cursing, with a feeling of chaos or being divided. He came out strong, prepared, centered, clear, not with a pretty perfect picture, but with a depth of being, a spiritual knowing that was grounding. Can we sit with that? 
Can we sit in the garden and value its gifts? Part of the evolutionary impulse to metabolize discord and expand our capacity is met in the garden. Are we willing to get it all out in the garden? In whatever way we do that, in whatever way you get it all out, put it all out on the table, in whatever way you process until you come to the sacred, until we find ourselves and feel ourselves as grounded. Can we be in the fullness of the transformation experience without running from it? So that even in the midst of it, even in the midst of what sometimes feels like anguish and pain and suffering or disillusionment, we can find the sacred, we can be the sacred, we can become the sacred, and we can live with our hearts open. Can we sit in the garden? You know what happens with a butterfly if you open the chrysalis before it's time and you don't allow the butterfly to emerge on its own when it's ready, the contents of the pupa seem like an amorphous mess. In fact, the very act of struggling against the cocoon pumps the blood and the life into the butterfly's wings. It actually strengthens its wings. And if you break it out before it's time, what happens? That it comes out injured, it withers. And the same is true of us. We come out with injury. We come out with resentment. We come out with anger. We come out activating and expressing and embodying the discord that was not healed. But the promise of the garden is that if we can surrender all that is in a moment, we will be fortified. There will be a balance, uh, an experience between presencing the fullness of the human condition and being aware of and having access to the dimensions of spiritual space within us that inner light within, that light that illumines. One of my favorite Unity authors, Sig Paulson, says this about the light. The light is there, vibrant, ready to reveal its presence and energy. Once you become conscious of this inner light, a subtle and marvelous change takes place in you. You don't suddenly sprout wings and flit from place to place, but you become aware of a new dimension of your own being. He goes on to say, you begin to do your own thinking and to have inner revelations of your own. This is what the master teacher lived He lived the permission to have your own inner revelations, to seek and find, to expand. So can we recognize whether we're in the garden right now or whether we recognize this from a time or the, from the past or we know that we will come upon it sometime in the future. Can we remember this? Fear not the garden. The garden has its gifts. Notice that it's called the garden. It's the place where we sit. But there is so much available. There is so much available in that space. If we get out too soon, we might not fly. We might not reach our potential. We might not get the gift that is sitting there for us.
understanding this spiritual process of transformation, understanding this template for divine experience can help us not only support ourselves and support others that are in the garden, but it can help support us as one humanity, moving through times. So can we ask ourselves, what is mine in this story? What is for me in this garden moment, this stage, this place of consciousness? And how does this hold the key to my story, to my struggle in this moment? Can I have patience with the process? And what is it for humanity that we're being squeezed through, that we are facing, that we simply can't go around, that we must go through, that we can't bypass, that we don't want to bypass, that as humanity, we want to do the work so that we can transcend and evolve, so that we don't get out too soon without strong wings to fly and meet our potential. And then we have tomb time, tomb time. The same patience is needed in the tomb time. Do we allow ourselves time in the tomb, in the darkness, stripped down in the silence, in the place of nourishment where we can be prepared and nurtured? It said that there were three days in the tomb that's not three literal days. That's the time that it takes in that space of wholeness and completion to surrender to the room. Many resist this surrendering. They get up and they walk right out, no matter how weak they are, no matter how injured we are, no matter how unprepared we might be for what is ahead for fear of dying in the tomb. We might come out bleeding and broken, injured without realizing that the tomb time is part of the sacred journey into the resurrection. It's a place of silence in the darkness, in the stillness. Remember, a victim didn't emerge from the tomb. A victim never emerges from the tomb time. We are nourished in the tomb. The way shower, the teacher emerged from the tomb. Love emerged from the tomb. Charles Fillmore says this about the tomb. He says the tomb where Jesus was laid to rest represents an elevated, peaceful state of consciousness in which he rested for three days prior to his resurrection. The word of truth within Jesus did not die, but was quietly spreading from point to point during this period. Getting ready for the supreme test, the overcoming of the appearance of death. For us, the tomb represents a high state of consciousness in us in which we improve in character along all lines. We not only grow into a broader understanding, but we also increase in vitality and substance. We are resting in God and at the same time gathering strength for the power of greater demonstrations to follow. In this state of consciousness, the word of truth is not idle, but quietly spreading. This process continues until the whole consciousness is vitalized by the Holy Spirit. Can we be in the tomb? Can we trust the tomb time rather than struggling, trying to remove the rock? Recognize that the stone will roll away when the process is complete. When the healing is revealed when the wholeness is experienced, when the spiritual transformation happens, patience, prayer, and the practice. They're not something that can be given to us. 
there's something that the master metaphysician demonstrated and showed they need to be awakened within us. So the invitation, the Easter invitation is to be fully in each stage where you are, to have patience with the process, with the speed of our world. We always want someone else to do it for us, someone else to digest or metabolize. We want the hands of time to fly by when things are difficult. We want them to be over. We want growth, but we often hate growing. But the Easter story reminds us that each stage has its gift. That we can trust the time in the garden. We can trust the time in the tomb. And this Easter reminds us to be, to simply be right where we are with what is and to trust the process. Even if that includes allowing ourselves to feel pressed and squeezed, we can be nourished and renewed remembering that we will find the sacred. We do find the sacred, but it's not something that happens to us. It is in our becoming. And the resurrection is assured. It is the realization of the perpetual indwelling life of knowing our spiritual resources come to our aid and knowing that there is no opposite to life. That this demonstration is a demonstration not only recorded in history, but experienced in real time. Let there be light, and there was. Namaste. In this now moment, we call forth the light the love, the presence of spirit that we are. Choosing to turn within, we release our focus on outer distractions. As we choose to come apart for just a while and allow the power and presence of spirit to move through us for just this time knowing that we can pick up those outer thoughts, those outer, outer worries, those outer concerns again, if we so choose. But for right here, right now, right where we are, we focus only on spirit's presence and the transformation that is unfolding within us. So in this place of divine connection, we choose to focus our energy, our knowledge, our presence on that light which shines from within us, that light which knows the way for us to move forward, that light that knows that we are the sacred itself an expression. And so as we enter into this time of prayer and meditation, we do so calling forth the light within us. Allowing that light to recognize those human elements of ourselves that show up those parts of our very human reality, our very human condition, and yet to know that although they are present, this light overcomes. And so we allow the light of spirit to guide us in our transformation this afternoon. We allow the light of spirit to support us 
and our transformation. And so we rest now in this presence as we allow it to awaken ourselves to a greater understanding of who and what we are. As we allow it to divinely support us as we go through our own garden experiences, our own crucifixion experiences. As we allow it to support us as we emerge fully transformed and fully resurrected to the light that we are. We move now into a time of stillness as we focus on this story as our story. As we focus on the experience of this day as our experience. Knowing that as we go into this time in the stillness, that we come out more of the light transformed in consciousness. And so with that as our intention, we enter into the stillness together now. so gently. We feel ourselves returning to this time and this place. As the stone rolls away, we see our wholeness revealed. As the stone rolls away, we see ourselves awakening to the truth within ourselves. As the stone rolls away, we see ourselves for the light that we truly are. And so in this moment, we ground ourselves in that light as we allow ourselves to no longer seek the sacred, but instead to know from this moment forward that we are the sacred. And so in this moment we call forth our light, allowing it to shine brightly on this Easter morning, just as it shines on every day of the year. And it is for that light in this moment that we are truly grateful. And so it is. Amen.